Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Good Grief. My name is Dr. Christine Malone, and in this podcast, we talk about trauma, tragedy, and survival. In each episode, I will interview someone that has gone through grief in some way, and we will discuss the impact it has had on their life. By sharing these stories, we hope that others won't feel alone should they be going through similar situations. Enjoy. Okay, so... Yes, thank you so much for listening. Um, My guest today is going to tell us a bit about how she helped navigate her children through uh, grieving the loss of a grandparent. So um, if you'd like to just tell us some about that story, um, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yes. Oh, it's funny because you never know where to start. And and one thing that you just said is, you know, helped helped her, her children through the loss of a grandparent. And it made me realize, well, did I really, right? Did I really? So so you step back and you say, what are the things that you did that you hope helped them, them through? So in my case, it was my father-in-law and my kids were all girls, two, four, and six years old. So the six-year-old was the only one really able to understand that pop-up was sick and wasn't getting out of bed and he couldn't come visit anymore. Um, And I called a relative who has a medical background and and asked advice, well, do I tell her that he's not going to make it? Yes, it's considered important to prepare children that are uh, uh, able to understand something um, that that perhaps, you know, the doctors can't help pop up any more than they already have and and his heart's going to stop working and then he's he's going to die. So we did all that. We, We did our best. Um, What was particularly hard in a couple of scenarios is my my husband is an only child and his dad was his best man at our wedding. They were best besties in that regard. And it was a very rough time for him as well. Compounded with we never had outside family babysitters pretty much except my (laughs) in-laws for six years. So then we had to add that to the mix in order for my husband to be able to spend time with his father because he was a stay-at-home parent and I was the breadwinner. And so all through this, I was still needing to go to work and I didn't have a boss who was understanding of the situation. So it was the, the ultimate juggling act. I remember being in San Diego and my and calling my father-in-law and he, when he first told me that they found, he had already lost a lot of weight and wasn't doing well. And they finally found the, a mass. And that was his way of telling the daughter-in-law, not his son, what was coming. So I actually sat in a patio restaurant overlooking the the Navy um, base in San Diego, which just coincidentally happened to be where my father-in-law was based as a young man, and just sat there and prayed. And I said, dear God, how am I going to get my husband and these kids through let alone the illness through to the loss through to any kind of recovery and help my mother-in-law, however that could be done. And so I just prayed and I didn't really get, of course, you don't really get any answers, but you do gain some strength. So flash forward, he was from that point, he was gone in a three month period. And um, so then comes a few funny stories in the sense that it wasn't funny to tell my six-year-old what happened because she you'd think we'd never told her in any shape or form that he was that sick she really didn't grasp it so that's a very very bad sad memory for me and my husband the four-year-old was like oh okay she didn't get it set the two-year-old we didn't she was there she's like you know i can i have some juice right she's two so um so everything centered around initially the six-year-old coping so my my first thought in sharing with everybody is is where are your children and their ages and and not just ages but ability to comprehend and you're going to handle and help it's so important to help each one individually which takes a lot of freaking time to spend time alone with each kid to walk them through it so the first the oldest at 6 years old for probably like the first you know, 90 days were really hard to the point where the four-year-old said, why is she crying again? (laughs) And I, well, she said that Papa died, really? And she didn't get it yet. But then um, at the, at the, I think six month mark is when the four-year-old pushing five by then came to me and said, where's Papa? How come he didn't come back? 
And then I was back to square one explaining that he was sick and his heart stopped beating and, you know, did, oh, and, and with the oldest, it completely worked. He's, he's in heaven. He's looking down on you. He loves you. You could feel the love in the house. And she loved all of that, which I still believe was the second one said, I said the same thing. She goes, that's ridiculous. I want him here so I can hug him. None of that matters because I can't hug him. And so I had to pivot and said, you know what? You're right. This really stinks that you can't hug him. And I'd feel just like you do the way you. So yeah, we can feel a little angry that we can't hug him, but it's, we can't change that. So we'll keep talking about it. And, and then we did. Right. Okay. <laughs> Flash forward about six more months and a whole year had gone by since he passed. And the now three-year-old who had been two looks at me one night when I'm putting her bed, she goes, where's Papa? When's he coming? I said, are you kidding me? To myself, I have to revisit this a whole year later. I thought I got through the worst, but it was in there. Negative memories live in little children. They just don't know what to do with them. Right. And so it was coming forward. That missing was coming forward and she had the ability, mind and verbal ability to ask about it. So there we were back to square one. But then part of that was Christmas time, just a couple months after he died. And every, and the middle one, <clears throat> we didn't have a well-furnished house yet at all. It was all, the whole dining room was empty. And my middle daughter, the one that was like, yeah, this stinks. She started pulling toys from one room to that room. And then the next day there'd be something else. And they had little chairs and the next thing, something else. And then all of a sudden I heard the oldest say, let's go to Sam's house. So they go into the other room and they'd go to Sam's house. And then they'd bring in something else, their little plastic toy dishes, and they'd pretend to have a meal at Sam's house. And then the little one started saying, because she was really verbal early, yeah, let's go to Sam's house. So I, I said, all right, something's going on here. Why does Sam have a house in the house? You know. <laughs> and then I realized it was palpable that their house had changed. They were making a new house to be like the old house. So for Christmas that year, I bought them little miniature everything you could think of for a house, a little washer dryer and a little couch and a little this, a little that. I embraced that they needed something different that we weren't able to maintain because of the grief in the house. And so they had Sam's house. And I said, my husband's like, this is ridiculous. Why are they doing it? And I said, they need it. Just step back. And they, I think they need it. So they had Sam's house for, I don't know, four, five, six months. And then Sam's house went away because the grieving in, in the house was also developing in a, in a way that everybody was adjusting, I guess, right? My husband, who never had a, a, a crossword ever, for his kids, most patient man on the planet, about three, four months after his father died, he was like, you know, the kids were annoying him. <laughs> yeah. And and I said, well, you can't take it out on them. They have no clue why suddenly dad's crabby. I get it. I said, so if you keep being crabby, I won't even let you around them. How could you say that to me? I'm grieving so much. And I don't know if he used that word, but you know, I'm feeling so terrible. I said, feel as terrible as you want call me names, curse at me, do whatever you need to. They're too young to get it. And so just, just do that. So I, I wouldn't call myself a punching bag, but he embraced it. And, and he knew finally with me, he could be miserable and, and show a side of himself that he never thought existed. Um, so that, that was also helping the kids through it because they didn't have to adjust to what's wrong with dad. Right. So he worked really hard at that. Um, so flash forward, I did a lot of reading, as you can imagine, and said, okay, um, avoid the cemetery visits, um, but keep him alive at the dinner table, keep him alive at the holidays, keep a picture of him on the refrigerator for the rest of their lives, and don't shy away from answering the hard questions of why did he have to go? or what really was wrong with him. And if, so the conversation was a new one every year. It, it was a, it's a, I hate to break it to the listeners, but it's a perpetual to this day talking about um, how we all got through that time period and how we helped grandma get through it and how we made new memories with grandma so that we didn't um, 
make the new memories into bad memories. Like in other words, if we started taking, she loved Atlantic City. So we all went to Atlantic City with her. So she had new memories, even though she was missing him on those trips, it was still new memories with the grandchildren, things like that, you know? Um, so it, it never actually has ended because now the girls are parents and we're grandparents. And now they're asking about their pop-up again. It's okay. We like that. Um, but I, he died of a, a small oat cell lung cancer that again, until he had symptoms all in here, his shoulder of all places, um, it had that it had already metastasized. He, and he, this was a man who went for regular physicals, but there was no indication and he didn't smoke. And so I, life happens right now. There's always a silver lining and a beautiful thing. At least that's what I look for. We never had a babysitter outside of our family. And a friend of mine, I'm still friends with today, said, I need you to meet Jill. So I told my husband, we're going to invite Jill over because he need, you need to go spend time with your father who's dying. No, we're not getting a different babysitter. Uh, yes, we are. So I normally, you know, wouldn't want to go against him during such a difficult time, but I knew he couldn't think it's his father. He wasn't thinking as, as clearly as maybe he would, you know, the grieving was already beginning. And um, so we didn't talk to each other for one whole night because I dug my heels in, he dug his heels in. And then we did meet Jill right after it just turned out his father passed. And then he loved Jill and we're, Jill's still in our life all these years later, even though she's long not been a babysitter for us. Um, she's in her seventies now. And she was a godsend to my husband who was still the stay-at-home dad who lost his support system and lost his parents. Basically uh, it's so much change at once. Now, my, my husband's a wonderful person and he grew up kind of like that one of those if, if you had have a stereotypical spoiled child he was it and he could get over on his mother all through his childhood tell her whatever she wanted to hear and she believed every word of it but he still grew up good somehow right um but he grew up a little selfish at times because it was part of the atmosphere he grew up in well it's like all the giving good things about my father-in-law when he passed landed in my husband after he died and all of a sudden my kids had an even better childhood than they ever did and I had a better husband than I ever thought I I already thought I had a good one but now I had this better one who actually talked about our feelings and wanted to uh, hear what the girls had to say about everything and it, it was just it wasn't there before his father died and so I couldn't believe I said okay God, if this is what was meant to be for my kids to have an even better childhood than they were already having, I guess I'll take it, you know? And my husband got there when he, when I first said that to him, he's kind of like, no, no. I said, well, maybe not, but you clearly respected your father and you embrace who he was and you're bringing that to your children. And that he said, well, yeah, I'm trying, you know? So, so yeah, it was, uh, so the, the navigating them through is still going on. <laughs> but to a much lesser degree. And, um, and it has to be individualized for each child because they process, no matter what age they are, they still process grief and loss in a different way than the other, than, than they're individuals. Yeah. Right. So true. I love the comments you made about kind of keeping the memories alive. So you've got the photos, you know, and in, in, in my case, when my first husband passed, I had a Christmas ornaments with our pictures on it. And I, I would hang my, my daughter who's grown and has kids grown now has that ornament on her tree and oh, so on. So that's beautiful. The various things where it's like, you know, to ignore that this person was here is not happening, right? They were here. Um, and I call those, um, what you described, I call them pockets of grief. Those times when something else comes up, um, for example, my, when my daughter got married and her dad wasn't there, you know, these types of things that come up, um, really is are you do you do have to work with the kids and kind of say hey yeah I understand that you're missing this or whatever um and to to I can totally relate to the whole talking to little little kids too because little kids don't they just don't understand the whole gone forever thing and mm -hmm. I, I, I I'm glad that they don't I mean I want children to be we you know, adults barely I know, them, though I know it's yeah and you want to keep kids from feeling pain right I mean that's that's what we're supposed to do right but then these things happen and and it's a natural part of life um and i, I love i just love this this story about you know the kids all asking at different times and so on because i think that's pretty 
dark. It can be exhausting as a parent. I can, I can see that. <laughs> well, that's saying, I kept a sense of humor, like, really? I thought I was done with this part, you know, <laughs> and just yeah. kept a sense of humor, but did, yeah, you do your best to, yeah. um, as a parent to, yeah. to be there to answer the questions or even bring up. So I didn't always wait until it was brought up because sometimes all of us, right. We need to talk about something, but we don't know how to bring it forward. So sometimes I would, it, I always give the funny example of my husband. So he's not verbally effusive. It's never been his way. He's a show, not a say. And so the, the I joke, I have a friend who says, well, you know, your husband's a man, a few words. And, you know, I'm always at, ask my husband why he doesn't always say, I love you and this and that. I said, well, I said to my husband one day, you can't live without me. And his answer was, so? <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I needed. <laughs> and that's him. It's not, it doesn't come easily. And my middle daughter's the same way. It's really hard for her to bring forth the words like that, but she will show you in a million different ways. Now she's married and she's a mom, a million different ways, how much she cares and wants and cares about people's well-being and things like that. It's just, we're all different, you know? Yeah. And I think especially when it comes to kids, little kids, especially that it's, it's very important to try to explain things to them in a way that they can understand. It doesn't scare mm -hmm. them. It doesn't, mm -hmm. them, um, you know, feel like you've just stopped talking. Cause then if you don't talk about it, then you have this atmosphere of we can't talk about it or it's something bad. Right, the big secret about. or something. Yeah. Never. That's just going to fester and that's never going to be a good thing either. So um, mm -hmm. I'm impressed with the way you, you handled that. But if you had anything that you would do differently, I mean, especially when they were so little, um, mm -hmm. can you think of anything that you would say to someone who's in your shoes and they've got little littles and, and try to explain to them that, you know, Papa's not going to be here anymore or anything mm -hmm. like that. Any thought comes to mind? Yeah, you know, you you take everything day by day and then you look back and you say, yeah, what what could have helped more? And I think it was when he was in the throes of dying that I I couldn't I couldn't leave my husband who was with his father and his mother or I felt like I shouldn't at that point. My sister took the kids, the girls, and I and so I did talk to two out of three on the phone, you're going to sleep at Aunt Chrissy's tonight. And the two-year-old really didn't get it, you know, and where's mom? And she was a nightmare to get to sleep. Well, actually the four-year-old was worse than the two-year-old. She says, I'm not going to bed. She told my sister, you know, and, and because she was just, where's my, where are my parents? And I never sleep at Aunt Chrissy's. Why? Yeah. So I think I would have gone to the girls sooner. I stayed overnight. And then in around eight in the morning, um, I left to, to, because the girls needed to see their mother. You know, I knew that in, innately. And so I went to my sister's and, you know, was with the girls. And then my husband called and he said, he's gone. And I'm like, he's gone. Yeah, I was supposed to be there in my own head. I'm thinking, oh, I said, okay, he's gone. He's at peace. And and how are you doing? He's like, well, I'm glad he's at peace. Okay. So I thought to myself, well, gosh, is it one of those moments where the person dying knows they can let go or want to let go? Because he couldn't speak, but we believed he could hear. And of course, I told him, you know, where I was going. And so his grandchildren were with their mother. And he was with his wife and son. And his niece, who was like a daughter, was there. Everybody that he loved the most was safe and and okay and I I want I've so I've always felt did he let go at that time because he he felt the peace of it I you know I guess if I get to meet him again someday I will yes. you know find <laughs> out I, yeah find out my long list of questions for people you know so um yes but, but I wish that I to help the girls more I wish I had gone to them sooner so there was less mystery for them yeah and, and so that's one thing we would do differently because um, they probably needed me more, definitely needed me more than he did at that moment, you know? Oh, that's a good point. So, that's actually a really good point, right? And yeah. Yeah, no, I hadn't thought about that. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Well, do you have anything else you want to tell our listeners about this, the whole navigating kids through the loss of a grandparent? I, I, I'm admiring how you did it because I think you did a great oh. job. 
Well, it, you read a lot and you, and you, you, and I always say, talk to my girls. They'll tell you if I really screwed it up or not. You know, I can tell it one way. They might, you know, tell it another, but um, no, I, I don't have anything to add. You know, just always remember how, how fragile your kids are at every age, because what I'm learning as, as a mom of these three grown women is that even though I've really, my husband and I both have done our best to raise them to be these independent women who know how to make good decisions, that they still need their support system and they need their friends. They need their mom and dad. They mm -hmm. need, you know, important people in their life. They need the village. Yes. And, and I, so I, as I, as they grow into their mid and late twenties, one will be 30 this year. Um, I encourage them to have friends of women that are my age or my ilk or my time frame because I don't live near right next to two out of three and it's okay to have those relationships. So my youngest does have someone on Long Island and I have yet to meet her. Her name is Loretta. I can't wait to meet her. And she met her because my daughter was her son's home health aide right through to his death last year. So they are forever bonded because they brought Susanna to the hospital to take care of him while they went to shower and come back. Um, and there's a lot to that story, but they're bonded forever, Loretta. So she, my daughter in many ways is the daughter that Loretta it just didn't happen in Loretta's life, you know? And I'm grateful for that. Not, yeah. not some might feel differently, but they have each other yeah. and she brings spirituality into my daughter's life, which I'm grateful for as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, just place, place there for a reason. I, I happen to believe that things happen for a reason and the way things aren't really, uh, you know, people are brought into our lives, um, to help us at times when they need help. And I think that's important to recognize that, to, to recognize them and not push them away and so on. It's always, um, a good yeah. one. Too. So yeah. And I'll, also, I'll tell you a quick story also is when my girl, when my, when a close friend passed away and her mother found it hard to talk to me after a while, that happened to me when I was um, nine years old. So I, so God was getting me or somebody was getting me ready. You know, then a neighborhood girl died of a brain tumor and she was nine years old and the mother couldn't talk to me. She never talked to me again. And, and even at nine, my mother must have tried to explain it, that it was too painful for our neighbor. So I got it. I never felt bad that that neighbor didn't talk to me. But then you flash forward. And by the time I got married, had kids, she called my mother and she said, do you think she would send me a Christmas card and with pictures of her kids and that she was ready to. And uh, I, get, I do get choked up about that very quickly. She's 92 now, still in touch. And of course I said, yes, why, why would I not meet them where they are? Right. It's yep. hard it on takes, everybody. It takes people different times to process. And, you know, there's no yeah. right or wrong way to do this. Exactly. It's just, we are all human. So how do we get through that? But yeah. yeah, that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that part about that. But well, I want to thank you again for your time today. It's been wonderful chatting with you. Thank you for your stories. And, um, well, yeah. Thanks so much. I will. Thank you for having me, Christine. You're, the, you know, I'm spiritual. You're doing God's work, bringing this to all your listeners to help them through some of their most poignant and difficult times in their lives. And your openness is what makes the difference. I'm sure. I'm sure. So thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Good Grief. To hear more about my personal story, please pick up a copy of my book. The Day I Became the Spider Killer, a memoir of trauma, tragedy, and survival, available in paperback, Kindle, and Audible via Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online book retailers.